my research explores educational experiences of deaf learners in mainstream secondary schools um, using their voices to inform practice. It was approached with personal and professional experiences of inclusion um, and deafness. So being deaf myself, I've got experiences of inclusion in a mainstream setting. Um, I'm passionate about raising deaf awareness and inclusion for deaf young people. Okay, so a bit about the background and my rationale. Um, obviously a person who's not able to hear as well as someone with normal hearing is said to be deaf. That can be mild, moderate, uh, severe or profound. Um, within my research I use deaf and deafness for all levels and that's generally the way it's going um, across the profession as well. Um, so it's complex, profoundly misunderstood and there's, you know, that's partly due to the diverseness of the deaf population um, and the dominant sort of hearing society that we live in. So I put up there, there are 52,798 deaf children and young people in the UK, um, and that's age 0 to 19, and 77% of those are attending mainstream schools, hence why I wanted to look at mainstream. Um, research demonstrates that they're at risk of academic and social exclusion. Generally, um, I put up there, Research shows at all examination stages that they're not doing as well as their hearing peers. Um, they obviously socially, because it's very misunderstood, you know, they can feel very isolated. Um, they're often the only young deaf person in their school as well. And then obviously, in terms of rationale for my project, there's very little research that looks at their experiences, their voice, particularly in mainstream settings. And there's limited research by deaf researchers and within the field of educational psychology. Okay, I have two quite simple research aims. So obviously to look at uh, barriers and experiences of support, so facilitators um, in learning, and then the same barriers and experiences for support for social interaction in their setting. So, methodology. I use the social constructionist ontology and epistemology. Um, obviously, I wanted to construct deafness within a social discourse, sort of perceiving deafness as a story rather than sort of an objective disability helping to sort of reformulate how it's perceived. And obviously that helps to sort of establish the reformulation of deafness as a positive construction, rather than being constructed as that measurable disability sort of based on an ableist conceptualization of reality. Um, as I've mentioned, it was, came sort of from an insider perspective, being deaf myself, and obviously acknowledge that, that obviously my personal experiences have influenced my research process, uh, my interactions with participants, and of course the findings. So participants, you can see in the table, um, I had five deaf participants. Very, I think, sort of emphasizes the diverseness of the population. And they were recruited from Greater London, local authority boroughs through the local authority hearing teams. Um, and then I use interpretative phenomenological analysis, so IPA, um, based on the process by Smith et al. And that was obviously to, to, I wanted to use IPA to get their sort of rich, detailed stories of the sort of participants' accounts of their deafness. So, five uh, group experiential themes. Um, I'm not going to read them out, but they're on the slide. Um, obviously, their experiences were mixed with positive and negative experiences at school, which obviously in turn led to positive 
and negative perceptions of deafness, sort of by themselves, but also by their hearing peers and by, by school staff. Um, they illustrate that inclusive education for deaf students requires an emphasis on appropriate um, co-produced support um, in order to minimise the barriers of social and academic and to celebrate diversity, difference and support their sense of belonging. Um, I also use self-determination theory as a sort of as a construct to a um, theoretical lens for my findings as well, but I'm not going to talk about that much now. Because I want to show you some quotes. So I put social and academic on one slide, and, and these are the facilitators to inclusion, so support inclusion. Um, you can see that sitting at the front of lessons is really important. That's obviously to promote the better access to speech, lip reading is easier, facial expressions. Um, we've got using radio aid, two of my participants use the radio aid. That's uh, like an assistive listening device, and the teacher wears a microphone, and it transmits to their um, either hearing aids or cochlear implant. And again, obviously that, that raises the volume. Interestingly, um, she said, I think it was Catherine, that she never forgets. And you'll see, I don't think I put it as a quote, but that was obviously a barrier as well because a lot of teachers forgot and they were not necessarily using them correctly. So it was a facilitator and a barrier. Uh, regular check-ins were important, just in the lessons, to make sure they understood, knew what they were doing. And also regular meetings with a key member of school staff, so two mentioned the Sanko and their form tutor, just again to ensure that the support is working for them and if there's any issues. And then lastly, which I found really interesting, is only one participant really spoke about their teacher of the deaf, and interestingly, they were deaf themselves. So and he spoke a lot about how important that relationship was for him in sort of the relatedness, the empathy. So yeah, that was really, really interesting. The rest didn't really mention their teacher of the deaf or didn't even know they had one. So quite interesting. Barriers. Um, what have I got? Lip reading came up again. Um, exaggerating lip movements, thank you, is, is really not helpful, makes it harder to lip read. Um, and I guess that's showing that lack of awareness, that lack of understanding as well. Um, getting the balance of check-ins right. We talked a lot about the over-checking in is actually embarrassing and not right, which emphasises working and listening with the young person, not just assuming it works for all the same students. Uh, group work is difficult. Obviously, volume is obviously going to go up, and lip reading multiple voices is also quite difficult. And then the last one is quite a sad example um, of complete lack of awareness and understanding being sent out of a lesson just for asking the teacher to repeat you know, the instruction. So, yeah, some quite extreme examples, but some more so very positive examples. So, implications. I put EPs and schools together because for my research it was very much about EP supporting schools to put these things in place. So I think they were a place to sort of help develop and deliver training for school staff. Um, it came out that that needs to be for all school staff and then more in depth for those that are actually teaching deaf students. Um, and that needs to be co-produced with any deaf adults or deaf students within the community as well because it's really important to have that co-production element. Um, interestingly, actually, I should point out that one of my Year 7 students uh, had actually presented to her form and then her year group. So, you know, it is really important to ask them whether they want to or not because they may actually want to present, you know, training, awareness sessions themselves. Mentioned awareness sessions and then also um, thinking about the deaf peers and deaf adult role models, that came out as a really big theme, as in lots of them didn't have that, thank you. Um, and just providing you know, the opportunities for them, again, their choice, if they want to meet with those deaf adult role models, 
deaf peers. And then I've already mentioned about acceptance and difference, sort of in the school ethos, you know, we can act as EPs as the critical friend to support them um, in a sort of social political context of education and help them to navigate promoting that acceptance and difference. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you.